Western historiography often portrays the Atlantic Ocean as a virtually uncrossed barrier before Christopher Columbus, suggesting it was as formidable as traversing several galaxies. This perspective has overly romanticized Columbus's voyage, insinuating it was beyond human capability and sidelining any consideration that others, particularly Africans, could have achieved such feats. The Atlantic Ocean is not just a vast expanse of water. It's a dynamic system of currents that flow like rivers within the sea. These currents are powerful forces of nature that can carry objects and, historically boats, across vast distances without the need for rowing or sailing. One of these currents, known as the North Equatorial Current, plays a particularly fascinating role in the story of transatlantic journeys. Imagine setting a relatively simple boat adrift in the Atlantic. Thanks to the ocean's currents, that boat can be carried all the way to the Americas without anyone having to row. It's a natural conveyor belt that has been operating for millennia. This phenomenon isn't just a matter of theoretical interest. It has historical significance as well. The North Atlantic Gaia is a large system of circular ocean currents that stretch across the North Atlantic from the eastern shores of the United States to the western coasts of Europe and Africa. This Gaia is part of a global conveyor belt of currents that circulate water around the world's oceans. Crucially, one of its components, the Gulf Stream, flows from the Gulf of Mexico, hugging the eastern coast of the United States before heading east towards Europe and Africa. For ancient mariners, Understanding or even inadvertently leveraging these currents could turn the daunting expanse of the Atlantic into a navigable pathway. The Gulf Stream, in particular, could provide a powerful assist, propelling vessels from the Americas towards Europe and Africa, reducing the time and effort needed to make the journey. While direct archaeological evidence for ancient African presence in the Americas, pre-Columbus, is sparse, intriguing findings such as the presence of cocaine in Egyptian mummies and similarities in pyramid building techniques across continents have fueled speculation and hypotheses about prehistoric transatlantic contact. The voyages of explorers like Thor Heyerdahl, who successfully crossed the Atlantic in the papyrus boat Ra 2, demonstrate that ancient boat designs could indeed make such a journey. One of his most notable trips was the Ra 2 expedition in 1970. During this adventure, he navigated from the west coast of Africa to Barbados in a boat made entirely of papyrus reeds. This lends credence to the possibility that ancient people could have exploited the natural highways formed by the Atlantic currents and winds. In addition to ocean currents, the prevailing wind patterns over the Atlantic also play a significant role. The trade winds, blowing from east to west in the tropical regions of the Atlantic, and the westerlies, blowing from west to east at more temperate latitudes, create conditions that, with the right knowledge and technology, could be exploited by ancient sailors to cross the ocean in both directions. The implications are profound. The natural pathways created by these ocean currents enabled pre-Columbian contact between different peoples, challenging traditional narratives about isolation and discovery. In the periods of early European exploration and contact, European explorers noted the presence of Africans in parts of the Americas. These observations were particularly frequent near the termini of the Atlantic's currents, like where the North Equatorial Current helped facilitate transoceanic journeys. This suggests that the currents played a role in bringing people across the ocean. Contrary to the Eurocentric narrative, there is evidence suggesting that interactions across the Atlantic predated Columbus. Columbus himself, along with his contemporaries, reported on voyages from West Africa to the Americas, indicating a history of transatlantic contacts. In his account of the second voyage, Columbus recorded that upon his arrival in Haiti, which he referred to as Espanola, he was informed by the indigenous inhabitants about the arrival of black-skinned individuals from the South and Southeast. These visitors were said to have arrived in ships, trading spears tipped with a golden alloy. Specifically in the Racolta, it is noted that Columbus was intrigued by the indigenous tales of Espanola about black visitors who had brought with them spear points made of a metal known as guanin. Columbus had these spear points sent to the Spanish monarchs for analysis, which revealed that they comprised a blend of 32 parts, 18 parts gold, six parts silver, and eight parts copper. Prompted by the indigenous accounts, 
Columbus sent these spear samples to Spain for assessment, where it was discovered that their composition closely matched that of the metalwork prevalent in African Guinea at the time. In a biography of Columbus, his son Ferdinand recounted that Columbus encountered black individuals in the area now known as Honduras. This observation wasn't isolated. Nearly a dozen other European explorers reported seeing black people in the Americas upon their arrival in the Western Hemisphere. In September 1513, Vasco Nunes de Balboa and his team descended the slopes of Cuarequa, in the region known today as Panama, and encountered several black men who had been captured by the indigenous peoples. Balboa inquired about the origins of these black individuals from the locals, who claimed to have little knowledge except for the fact that these people lived nearby and were frequently at war with them. According to records, these were the first black individuals sighted in the Indies. Peter Martyr, a leading European historian on the New World, suggested that these black men were shipwrecked Africans who sought refuge in the surrounding mountains. Father Fry Gregoria Garcia, a Dominican priest who spent nine years in Peru in the early 16th century, identified an island near Cartagena, Colombia, as the place where Spaniards first encountered black people in the New World. Similar to the situation in Darien, these Africans were found to be war captives among the indigenous populations. Additionally, in the 16th century, before the widespread enslavement of Africans, Cabello de Balboa documented a group of 17 black individuals who, following a shipwreck in Ecuador, rose to govern an entire province of Native Americans. These accounts challenge the notion of Columbus's voyage as the inaugural crossing of the Atlantic, highlighting a more complex history of interaction between the continents that includes significant African participation. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, part of the West Indies, archaeologists have made a fascinating discovery. Two skeletons dating back to the year 1250, which bore unique markings on their teeth, characteristic of African rituals. Not far from this site, they also found inscriptions written in a script used by the Tuareg people of southern Libya. These inscriptions referenced practices associated with ablution, suggesting a connection to Islam. This evidence points to the skeletons being those of Islamized black Tuaregs, potentially from the Mali Empire. The Mali Empire was likely the wealthiest nation globally during its peak. It maintained significant interactions with the Americas, with the Mandinka people's animistic beliefs, known as Mandinka Vitalism, influencing the Aztec civilization. Historical records indicate that the Mali Empire undertook ambitious voyages to the Americas as early as 1310 or 1311. These expeditions, ordered by Emperor Abu Bakari II, who was the elder brother of the famed Mansa Musa, involved fleets of 200 and then 2,000 ships. However, the Mandinka people were not the only ones to navigate the Atlantic. Chinese historical accounts from the Sung Dynasty era in the 12th and 13th centuries describe a land called Mulanpi, which Muslims from the Maghreb reached after sailing westward for 100 days. These documents, along with other sources, suggest that it was Arabs who introduced corn, a staple indigenous to the Americas, to the wider world. They also mention Arabs having a fruit resembling a pumpkin, another American native. Remarkably, in Venezuela, archaeologists have discovered Roman coins from the 4th century and Arab coins from the 8th century together. Roman coins remained in use long after the fall of the Roman Empire, circulating within Moorish territories alongside Arabic coins. The black Berbers, or Moors, from the Maghreb, who were a significant part of the population in both the Maghreb and in Moorish-ruled Spain-Portugal, likely played a crucial role in these transatlantic interactions. Given their dominance in the region, any East Atlantic expedition by the Arab Muslim Empire would have included, if not been led by, the Moors. Notably, historical accounts mention a Moorish ship crossing the Atlantic around the year 800, underscoring the extensive maritime capabilities and interactions of these early civilizations. A sculpture discovered in Peru, estimated to date back to around the year 900, depicts an African figure adorned with a chechia, a traditional North African headdress. This suggests that the individual was likely a Moor. Evidence thus points to the Atlantic Ocean being navigated regularly before Christopher Columbus by Africans, such as the Mandingo and Moors, and by Arabs. These findings indicate that contacts between Africa and America existed up to the 16th century, before the onset of European colonialism and the slave trade.
For centuries, the ancient civilization of Pharaonic Egypt maintained a significant connection with the Americas, leaving a deep impact on the development of Native American societies. While these ancient American cultures undoubtedly evolved their unique characteristics and innovations, it's evident that the roots of civilization across the Atlantic have a clear African origin. The revelation of interactions between Africa and America in ancient times is bound to be a surprising discovery for many. The Olmec civilization, recognized as Central America's first major civilization, served as the precursor to the Maya, Zapotec, Aztec, and Toltec civilizations. It is during the era of the native Olmecs, some 3,200 years ago, that the Egyptians are believed to have arrived in America. Moreover, there are strong indications that these intercontinental contacts may have begun even earlier. The earliest known great civilization in the Americas was centered around the Caral Soup civilization in Peru. This civilization built pyramids about 4,400 to 4,650 years ago. Among these structures, there's a special area with a circular shape located in front of the largest pyramid that dates back about 4,650 years. In the same region, archaeologists have found mummies that are 7,900 years old. These are quite ancient, but still about 1,600 years younger than the world's oldest known mummy, which was discovered in the Sahara Desert in Africa. Initially, this African mummy was thought to be 5,500 years old, according to early research by Professor Mori from the University of Pisa. However, later studies by Professor Tanjori, also from the University of Pisa, in 1980, determined it was actually 9,500 years old. Despite this, many people still refer to the mummy as being 5,500 years old and believe that the practice of mummification started in America. When comparing these ancient structures and practices, the pyramids provide a compelling piece of evidence about these civilizations' achievements. The Corral pyramids are step pyramids, the tallest of which reaches 18 meters, about 59 feet high. These are smaller compared to the earliest significant pyramid in Egypt, the step pyramid at Saqqara, which is three to four times taller. If we use the same dating methods for both, we find that the Egyptian pyramid at Saqqara is roughly 350 years older than the pyramids in America. The ancient city of Karal shares some intriguing similarities with Egyptian civilization, particularly in how both societies incorporated astronomy into their city layouts and celebrated events like the solstices. Just like the Egyptians aligned their structures with the Nile River, Karal's major buildings were positioned in relation to the nearby river, suggesting a deliberate planning to harmonize with the natural environment and its cycles, such as flooding. Long ago, the Egyptians built large boats from cedar wood that were 51 meters long. However, in 1969, an adventurer from Norway named Thor Heyerdahl wanted to show that the ancient Egyptians, even with their simplest boats made from dried papyrus, before their first dynasty could sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Heyerdahl worked with the Buduma people from Lake Chad to construct a boat named Ra, which set off from Morocco. Unfortunately, the Ra sank after traveling 5,000 kilometers, not too far from the West Indies. Heyerdahl realized he had missed an important detail from the original Egyptian designs. Undeterred, in 1970, Heyerdahl launched a second attempt with a new boat, the Ra II, incorporating the corrections. This boat successfully sailed from Morocco all the way to Barbados. This incredible journey proved that the ancient Egyptians could have crossed the Atlantic Ocean with their technology. The idea that ancient Americans might have traveled to Africa to learn from the Egyptians is also a possibility we can't dismiss. Evidence suggests that Native Americans reached German shores in 62 BCE, helped by the ocean's currents. Additionally, about 100 years later, pineapples, which are native to America, were known in the Roman Empire. As the scholar Ivan van Sertima pointed out, using a bit of humor, it's almost as if the Native Americans discovered Europe. It's believed there were connections between Egypt and America, 
way back during Egypt's old kingdom. These interactions paused, and then, interestingly, the Egyptians made their way back to America about 3,200 years ago. Imagine discovering 17 giant stone heads with features resembling those of African people buried near Mexico's Atlantic coast. Some of these heads are nearly nine feet tall and weigh as much as 50 tons. These massive heads face the Atlantic Ocean, almost as if they're standing guard, looking out with a stern gaze. Intriguingly, they're depicted wearing what appears to be Egyptian military gear, similar to helmets found in the tomb of Ramses III, where they're worn by sea soldiers. Even more fascinating is that these helmets seem to be styled over Nubian braids. Suddenly, these massive, expertly crafted faces showed up in America, hinting at the arrival of skilled outsiders. The Egyptians, known for their own colossal sculptures, likely played a big role here, sharing their expertise and deeply influencing the Olmec civilization with their African traditions. Studies by Andrei Wierczynski of Olmec burial sites reveal an African influence, showing that early on, 13.5% of the skeletons had African characteristics, mostly male. This percentage dropped to 4.5% later, suggesting that these African arrivals blended into the local population through marriages with Amerindian women. The fact that these early African individuals were mostly male suggests they might have been part of a military expedition. This finding also indicates that the African presence among the Olmecs wasn't from the very first settlers of America, who were believed to have come from Oceania and Asia, and later mixed with Asian groups arriving about 5,000 years ago. The motivation for the Egyptians' epic journey might be captured in ancient texts. The Popul Vuh, a sacred Mayan manuscript, mentions strangers arriving in seven boats seeking paradise. They landed near Veracruz, a key Olmec city. Similarly, ancient Egyptian tombs depict seven boats among the stars, celebrating the journey westward towards a divine paradise. This parallel suggests a shared quest for a sacred land, with Yaru and Yaro being words for paradise in Egyptian and American contexts, respectively. The word Ra, associated with the sun in Egypt, also appears in Mexico and Peru, underscoring the deep connections formed by this ancient expedition. In 1992, a respected toxicologist named Svetla Balabanova made a groundbreaking discovery. She found traces of cocaine in the hair of Egyptian mummies that were housed in a museum in Munich, and these mummies were over 3,100 years old. This was surprising because cocaine comes from plants native to South America, a continent that wasn't officially discovered by Europeans until thousands of years later. Despite thorough checks to rule out any mistakes and contamination, Balabanova faced significant backlash from some scholars who were reluctant to accept her findings. But the evidence was clear, suggesting that the ancient Egyptians must have had some form of contact with the peoples of ancient America long before the age of exploration. Balabanova's findings didn't stop with these mummies. She also found cocaine in 134 bodies from ancient Nubia. This discovery sparked much debate among historians and archaeologists just like the presence of tobacco in the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh, had previously stirred discussions about possible connections between ancient Egypt and America. The discovery of cocaine pointed even more strongly towards such a link. Another intriguing piece of evidence comes from a map created by the Turkish general and cartographer Piri Reis in 1513. This map was compiled from 19 ancient Egyptian maps, some dating back to 300 BCE, and possibly included knowledge from the legendary library of Alexandria. The accuracy and detail of the Piri Reis map suggest that ancient civilizations might have known much more about the world's geography than previously thought, adding another layer of mystery to the story of ancient cross-continental connections. This extraordinary map accurately depicts regions like West Africa, Western Europe up to France, and islands such as Cape Verde, Madeira, the Canary Islands, and the Azores. But the real showstopper? It presents South America with stunning precision, detailing the Andes Mountains and the Amazon River's path with an accuracy that wouldn't be matched by Europeans until centuries later. Interestingly, 
The map's precision in terms of latitude and longitude suggests that our ancestors had a sophisticated understanding of geography and navigation, at least since the construction of the Great Pyramid about 4,500 years ago. This was all long before Europeans managed to map the Andes or accurately trace the Amazon River in the 18th century. Despite Columbus's voyages, this map is fundamentally Egyptian in origin, showing a deep familiarity with South America nearly 900 years after initial contacts with the Olmecs. These contacts between Africa and the Americas didn't just exchange goods. They deeply influenced the cultures and civilizations of the New World. This cross-continental exchange wasn't limited to geography and architecture. Linguistic parallels like the words Yaru, Yaro, and Ra hint at shared knowledge or common influences between ancient Egypt and America. Indian historian R. A. Jairasboy points out more examples, like the words for crocodile and incense, showcasing a deeper, more nuanced connection than previously thought. The Egyptians, known for their monumental architecture, including the use of unique concrete blocks for building, might have shared this advanced technology with their Amur Indian counterparts. This ancient globalization hints at a world far more interconnected than we've imagined, with knowledge and ideas flowing freely across oceans and continents long before the age of exploration. Imagine visiting the ancient pyramids of Teotihuacan in Mexico and finding that the Pyramid of the Sun shares almost the same dimensions as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. It's a fascinating connection that makes you wonder about the ancient world. Both pyramids are nearly identical in size, suggesting a remarkable parallel between these two great civilizations. Then there's the Mayan calendar, remarkably similar to the ancient Egyptian calendar. Both civilizations used a 360-day year, with an extra five days added for celebrations, rounding out to a full 365 days. Writing, a cornerstone of civilization, also began with the Olmecs in America. The Mayan script, which originated from the Olmecs, uses pictures and symbols, much like Egyptian hieroglyphics. Even more intriguing are the similarities in mummification practices. Native Americans mummified their dead in a way that closely mirrors ancient Egyptian methods, including the removal of organs and the use of four jars, each representing a cardinal point and colored according to specific meanings that trace back to African traditions. Professor Rueta, who studied embalming methods in Peru, noted that the substances used for mummification in ancient America were strikingly similar to those used in Egypt, including balsamine, menthol, and various resins. In terms of burial rites, the dead were placed in sarcophagi, positioned in the Osiris posture, arms crossed over the chest and sometimes accompanied by a gold funerary mask, a practice reminiscent of the Nile Valley's customs. The practice of elongating the skulls of nobility was also shared, seen in both ancient Egypt and among the Mangbetu in Congo. The use of the color purple for ceremonial purposes is another parallel between African and American cultures. While the Olmec civilization is known to have been predominantly Amerindian, ancient Mayan pictographs frequently depict individuals with frizzy hair and elongated heads suggesting an African presence or influence. Scholars like Clyde Winters argue that it was the Olmecs who introduced pyramid building, religious technology, and writing to the Maya. This blend of influences highlights the interconnectedness of the ancient world, suggesting that these great civilizations may have shared more than just architectural and calendrical similarities. Archaeologist Jeffrey McCafferty shares an intriguing insight into the ancient pyramids found in Central America. He points out that the Olmecs, one of the earliest civilizations in the region, played a crucial role in shaping the cultures that followed. It's widely agreed among experts that the foundations of all Mesoamerican civilizations can be traced back to the Olmecs. Historian Michael Coe even suggests that the Olmecs were not just a major influence on the Maya, but should actually be considered the first Maya themselves. The intriguing evidence of ancient Africans' contact with the Americas, ranging from the skeletal remains in the U.S. Virgin Islands to the sculpture of a moor in Peru and the compelling accounts of black individuals encountered by Columbus and his contemporaries, paints a picture of a world where oceans were not barriers but highways connecting distant peoples. These findings challenge the traditional narrative that the world's civilizations developed in isolation until the age of exploration. 
They suggest instead that our ancestors were capable of and engaged in long distance voyages that brought about exchanges of knowledge, culture, and genetics far earlier than documented in our standard histories. This emerging narrative does not merely add a new chapter to our history books. It compels us to reconsider the very foundations of our understanding of the past. The presence of African features in ancient American artifacts, the accounts of European explorers, and the archaeological discoveries all point towards a complex web of interactions that predate Columbus's sail across the Atlantic by centuries. Such evidence hints at a global interconnectedness, suggesting that the oceans, far from being insurmountable barriers, were avenues for exploration, trade, and cultural exchange. Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. <laughs>